If you understand Italian, there is an excellent lecture from Professor Alessandro Barbero on this very topic. You will find a link in the description below. Did the Ius Prime Noctis really exist in the medieval period? Let's find out. Hey noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. First of all, what is the Ius Prime Noctis? Literally means the right of the first night in Latin, and it's a supposed legal right in medieval Europe, allowing feudal lords to have sexual relations with subordinate women, in particular on their wedding nights. We find the Ius Prime Noctis all over the place. We see it in fantasy, we see it in novels, historical novels, and in the movie industry. Say Braveheart, a very famous and popular movie where we see the Scottish are rebelling against the English, and the English king, at one point during the film, decides to have a little reunion with his parents, and they choose to bring back an ancient rite, namely the Ius Prime Noctis, that allows noblemen from England to sleep with Scottish women, and they decide to do that because they say, open quote, there are too many Scots in Scotland. That's the problem of Scotland. Quotes, quotes. Even in Robin of Loxley, we see the villain speaking with the local bishop, so involving clergy, and he says that he wants to take advantage of this right, that it is right, to sleep with a local woman, and you see, as still remember the scene of the bishop, that really reacts this way. He says, huh? You sprime noctis. Oh, oh. He's horrified by this idea of, oh my gosh, you want to do this, but he knows exactly what the villain in this case is talking about. But the real question that we have with this video is, did the Ius Prime Noctis really exist? Well, to answer this question, we're going to have a look at the sources, because mind you, in the medieval period, if there's one thing the medieval people did was to write. They wrote a lot. I mean, of course, there was no Netflix around, so they had to entertain themselves somehow. And they speak about loads of different things, loads of different topics. There are millions of documents. Now, two of the things that we're going to examine are medieval novels, specifically those that have to do with sex, because medieval people, yes, Catholic Church generally, generally speaking, condemned sex as being sinful, but still medieval people spoke, joked and wrote about it all the time, so that needs to be kept in mind. We'll see medieval novels, but we will also see notary acts, because keep in mind, lawyers, notary, they existed in the medieval period and they wrote down everything. And since we are talking about a use, so a right, shouldn't we find something that specifically talks about this? Use prime noctis. Medieval literature is very florid, it's explicit, they speak, joke, write, and tell us about all sorts of things pertaining to medieval society, taking into consideration all nations, all countries, all languages, and yet nobody, not even once, they do they mention the use prime noctis. Now, clearly, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. This is a very important thing that we need to keep in mind as we dive deeper into our research of this subject. But let me tell you more about the situation that we have with legal documents. You see, in the medieval period, peasants, farmers, villagers, of course because of the feudal system, were under the direct subordination of their overlords, the nobles. And we see medieval farmers complaining all the time. And the reason why we know this is because not only we see it through literature, but we also see it through notary documents, generally speaking written in Latin. Medieval peasants, farmers, villages had a lot of obligations towards the feudal lord. And I'll give you some examples here so you know exactly what we are talking about, what we are dealing with. For example, not only they had to pay taxes to the lord, they had to pay rent, they had to give him a cut of their profit from working the lands, because one thing we have to remember about the feudal period is that all the lands belong to the lord. Then the local lord is going to give these lands, when I say give I mean lend these lands, or rent them to a local family or several families of farmers and peasants and they're going to work the land and yet the lands belong to the Lord. Even a successful family that starts making some good profit regardless of all the different taxes and they decide to expand and they, they talk to another peasant family and they say hey Tom how about you sell me so I pay you you leave this little section of land that you're working on because I like that you've got a nice vineyard there I'll give you this money and so I start working on that land even when things like this happen between peasant families, they still had to give a cut to the Lord because originally the lands still belonged to the Lord.
sold, even when they were sold within farmer families. Sometimes you have obligation, this is all written down, we've got actual documents that testify about this, but there are many other kinds of obligations. For example, at least once a week, uh, one male from the family had to go and man up the tower. That's something we see and that's something that peasants complain about. Sometimes you have to, once a month, perhaps even more often than that, once every two weeks, you need to go, one of the members of your family need to go and work in the castle's moat around the castle. They need to do some work there for the Lord and this is not paid. These are obligations. And we see the peasants complain about these all the time. Sometimes they, they hire a lawyer and they meet with the local lord and they try to convince him and they say, hey, we're going to give you this amount of money, just take this obligation off. Now, sometimes the local lord will agree, other times he won't. He'll be like, this is an obligation that you have had since the times of your grandfather. He did it, your father did it, so you're going to do it. I don't, get, I don't care, you can keep your money. And this sometimes happens to the point that the situation escalates and local peasants and farmers, they go directly to the king and they say, you know, we're not happy with the local Lord. It's not right. I mean, this law that he just came up with, we don't want to give him uh, whatever it is. I mean, three, four, five pigs every year for, for Christmas. Uh, we don't want to give him this money every month. We already pay this other tax. Why they did he come up with this new tax that my grandfather wasn't paying? Or perhaps we don't want to send every single week one of our boys that need to help us farm the land and we don't want to man up the tower. Why does he not pay someone like a local man at arm? And all of these situations we see everything written down. Does anyone in the entirety of Europe, for the entirety of the medieval period, ever mention a complaint about the local lord sleeping with your son's wife during their marriage? No. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But let me continue my thesis here. The Ius Plimenoctis starts being mentioned after the medieval period, when we talk about the way we imagine it. Before that, there is nothing. Now, there is one piece of evidence from 1247 from a village in France that I'm going to tell you about in a little bit because that story doesn't really prove anything about the Ius Prime Noctis, but it does help us understand why medieval people and then people from the Renaissance and then in the 1800s and even recently now, we start understanding why people came up with this myth because a myth it is. There is a specific piece of document that has to do with the village of Verson in medieval France from 1247 that speaks about taxes, obligations. What's interesting about this specific place is that the land that was farmed and worked by the peasants belonged half to the local lord and half to the church, the Catholic church, to specifically to a monastery. And oftentimes the local lord and the monks, they complain and they fight about who's supposed to get this tax and who's supposed to get this specific service from the peasants. The monk that was writing down this information about it at one point tells us, yeah, people complain about it, peasants complain about this amount of money they need to pay, but back in the day, it, the amount was a lot more than now. Back in the day, this would have been a lot more expensive. And it was so expensive that sometimes peasant families would decide to give their own daughter to the local lord for one night and just tell them, you know what, do whatever you want as long as I don't have to pay that tax. This is the closest it gets to the idea of the use prima noctis, but notice it's not a right, it's not a use, and it's not something enforced by the local lord, it's something done. It was the idea of the father. The only piece of evidence that we have from 1247 is from a monk who's trying to justify, he's looking for a justification to say, yeah, you think you have it bad, but back in the old days, it was a lot worse. And it's not even the use prima noctis per se. It's a different situation. Now, one thing that did happen under the feudal system was the fact that, as we said, a local lord gives this land to a man. And this man starts working the land, making profit. But when he dies, he has no children, he has no offspring. What happens to the land? It goes back to the lord. The local medieval lords never allowed peasants to decide, I'm going to write a testament and give this land to my friend. That never happened. But if they did have children, if you are a farmer, you're successful and you have a son and you die, well, the, your land will be inherited, meaning that your son will inherit the right to work on it, but the land still belongs to the overlord. But what happens if you have a daughter? If she marries a man from the village, then that family, once you die, is going to get the lands inherited. But if she married someone from another village, that would be a completely different situation. And that was something that, generally speaking, medieval lords didn't like. They weren't happy when the daughter of one of their servants would marry outside the village. And if that happened, even though they tried to discourage it, if it really had to happen, then you needed to pay a 
substantial tax. That was the situation. So if your daughter was getting married to the son of the miller from the other village, you would have to pay a tax, a substantial tax to, the, to your overlord. So he will give you a blessing and say, yeah, okay, get married to whoever you want. The reason for that is because that way, as the overlord, you are getting money. And then if this new wet couple were to move into your village, great, nothing changed and you're still getting all the fruits and the exploits of that land. But if they do move away and go to the other village, you know, you're not going to have problems with the overlord that is taking care of that part because you already got your money. So this tax existed. That is the closest thing. And of course, it's something that the peasants and farmers and villagers complained about. As I said, we have a complaint for every single existing obligation, except the use prima noctis. No one mentions it. The third instance that we can use to reconstruct the beginning of this myth has to do with the church. Now, you see, in the medieval period, the Catholic Church didn't really have a great relationship with sexuality. So even though in the general public people spoke about sex, joked about sex, wrote about sex, and even drew stuff and little funny stories about sex, sex was still seen as a sin. And this included within the boundaries of marriage. So fornication, sex before marriage, absolutely forbidden. While while sex during marriage was allowed, but you had to do it just to procreate. You shouldn't really have too much fun with it. Now, in order to prove to God and the church that you weren't getting married just because you wanted to get laid, but you were doing it for a holy reason, then you had to wait three days, and this was very common in the medieval period, you had to wait three days before consuming the marriage. So you get married, you have the ceremony, you wait three days before you sleep with your wife. Now, as the families that were getting married started to be a bit more wealthy, because some peasants, some subjects to medieval kings and overlords were well off because of all the work that they were doing. So what people started doing is that they would go to the local bishop and tell him, Bishop, you know, I'm getting married tomorrow. I know I have to wait three days, but what if I give a donation to the church? Could we skip the three days part? And of course, bishops were delighted to oblige. They were like, yeah, sure, yeah, give a good donation to the church and then we're going to be okay. And so more and more people started doing that. Oh, we don't want to wait for three days. Let's just pay the bishop so the church is okay with it. And then slowly but surely it became an actual tax. And eventually this tax, people will start asking to abolish this tax. The church didn't want to abolish, but that's a whole different story. Moral of the story is historians like Professor Barbero believe that these three situations that I've just talked about are the basis for what will become the myth of the Ius Prime Noctis. Now, some of you might say maybe people didn't talk about it because it was a very private, personal matter. No, medieval people speak about everything. Maybe people didn't complain about it because it was seen as a right and therefore nobody really had a reason to complain about it because it was accepted as a right. And I have got an answer for that too. As we look at 1492, the date of the discovery of America, the New World, and we've got the Spanish, Hernán Cortés, Portuguese, Spanish, they start going into the New World. And what do they find there? Well, of course, they encounter peoples, civilizations, such as the Mexica, so in other words, the Aztecs. That doesn't just happen in modern-day Mexico, Cuba. They speak about all of these different civilizations. And they speak about them as savages. These are godless people. They are savages. They are wild. They don't even get dressed properly, they kill. You know, they speak about all of these great things. And the reason why they speak so badly and they belittle these people is because remember that the Europeans were subjugating, they were killing, they were stealing from these people. And since public opinion still existed in medieval Europe, it wasn't as important as it is today, but it still existed, they wanted people to see all of these acts as bringing the true faith, as civilizing these uncivilized people. And what's interesting is that all of these explorers of the 16th, 15th century, when they speak about these civilizations in Cuba, in Mexico, and they tell us, you know, these people are horrible, the way they do it is they all mention that among these barbarians and these savages, you had these overlords, and then whenever people were getting married, the local lord had the right to sleep with the bride before her husband. Such a horrible and atrocious thing, horrible. So these people are disgusting. We need to kill them, we need to subdue them and civilize them. Now, if medieval people thought that, automatically, it means that these things were frowned upon, they were looked at something disgusting, and so they weren't part of medieval European society. Because if they were, they would have no argument. People reading these books would say, well, that's the same thing that that over Muppet of an overlord did at the marriage of my cousin Tommy. It just didn't happen. So where does the myth come from? 
as the medieval period finishes, lots of different oral traditions and stories that have to do with the Jus Prima Noctis start to be born. Particularly in northern Italy, many of the towns, many of the cities that we have were founded by a group of peasants, a group of farmers that just had enough having to do with all these taxes and all these obligations towards the current feudal lord and just moved away, founded a new village. Uh, the town of Ivrea is one of these. And interestingly enough, in the traditional story of the famous carnival of Ivrea, uh, they say that the carnival of Ivrea starts because you have this medieval girl, Violetta, so in the medieval period, she was a smart girl who rebelled against her overlord who wanted to take advantage of the Ius Prima Noctis, but she was smart and she tricked him. Interestingly enough, though, is that this story is not medieval. People say it's medieval, but it isn't. First, because it's found nowhere in all medieval documents, and second, because the name of Violetta didn't exist in the medieval period. No girl from the medieval times was called Violetta. It's a name that becomes popular in the 1800s. Did it ever happen that a nobleman, a powerful man, took advantage of his power, money and authority to force himself onto a local poor girl? I'm sure that that happened. I mean, it still happens today. You can imagine that probably somewhere uh, you have got a student who is a cute girl, but she has got loads of debt like student debt and then she meets this businessman and he's very important he's a CEO and he's got money and maybe he's gonna tell her oh I can take care of that don't worry just come with me come with me to the hotel I'll take care of your student debt I'm sure it happens but it doesn't mean that now we say that businessmen in in the West in America uh, have a use prima noctis with students who have a loan but that's the situation really that was happening in the medieval period yes you had sometimes abuses yes you had sometimes feudal lords that maybe looked at the at the girl who just got married and thought you know what I like that girl and that idiot doesn't deserve her she's really good looking you know what just take that man and have him killed and so I can take uh, advantage of my powers these things happen but there is no evidence whatsoever that a right a use prime noctis a right of the first night that nobody complained about and everybody accepted ever existed. The way it's portrayed in the movies, in the media, it's a story that has an appeal. It's a story about people wanting freedom against fighting against tyranny and abuse. These things are compelling, but before accepting them and repeating them over and over again, we need to look at the sources. And the sources tell us that there is zero evidence that a Ius Prime Noctis ever existed and in fact all the sources including those as I mentioned of the conquistadors and other explorers of the medieval period and the late medieval period and the renaissance when they speak about other people then they come up with the same inventions which by the way weren't true so we and we have people in the medieval period itself that actually say that these things were false and that they were taking advantage of these savages these things were false but they were told to create a narrative and that's the same reason why even even today, in the movies and in the novels, we still find this medieval right that everyone knows, but nobody speaks about the Ius Prima Noctis. It was a myth. It didn't exist. That is my conclusion, but I would love to hear your opinion in the comments below. All right, noble ones. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you're not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.